A structural design requires you to consider many different factors. You need to make sure the design is safe, it either meets or exceeds the required structural capacities, it also looks at the serviceability requirements and is also robust. Beyond this, you also have competing factors from clients to make sure the building is efficient and make sure you're hitting those sustainability requirements. It can be quite hard to find an optimal design if you're taking the prescriptive code-based approach to design. However, there is a different way that allows you to optimize the design, making sure you're reinforcing the structure in the locations that it actually requires and not over-designing elements that may not need to. And this is performance-based design. So I'll be going through some of the key factors of what performance-based design is and how you can apply it to your designs today to ensure that you got the most efficient design possible. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. A performance-based design is more time-consuming and complex to undertake than the simplified prescriptive approach. So you need to make sure that you're actually using it in the right situations. If you have a simplified building that has simpler load paths, you may not achieve the savings that you're expecting from a performance-based approach. In those situations, it may be better to go down the more prescriptive codified design. But however, if you've got a complex design where there's multiple different load paths, and especially if it's governed by seismic design, performance-based design can achieve significant savings. Often when we think about performance-based design, we only really think about the seismic application of this method. However, it has a broad range of different areas that it can cover. Of course, it covers seismic, but it can also cover wind. It covers robustness. You can make sure that it hits serviceability requirements and even the progressive collapse or blast analysis. And it's not just new designs that you can apply it to. You can also apply it to existing structures. The performance-based approach was set about to try and assess when you had existing structures that had some damage, especially from earthquake, how can you possibly assess them to see whether they're still safe to live in? A performance-based approach to helping the performance of this video requires you to click the like button. Not only does it help me out, but also allows to get this video out to more people. Really where you start to see all the savings in performance-based design is when you start to push materials beyond their elastic limits. We all know that most materials have additional strength beyond the elastic range. This is where we're getting into that plastic design, most commonly done in steel, but also exists in concrete as well. When you approach it from the codified design, you're staying in that elastic state. That is, of course, unless you're doing an earthquake design and then you have ductility. So what ductility does, it allows you to yield some of the elements. They either go into that plastic range where they're going to overstrength, or they potentially fail and dissipating some of the forces. Apart from allowing for those plastic deformations to occur, I know what you're thinking, how can I apply a performance-based design to my structure to ensure that I have the most efficient design possible? Do I just reduce safety factors or allow some elements to yield? What do I do? Well, there's a number of different approaches, but most commonly it's synonymous with pushover analysis. Pushover analysis is a method where you apply forces to buildings, slowly ramping up until the building collapses. The collapse mechanism is when it's drifted to a certain point, at which point it's considered that the building has completely failed. And now it's an iterative based approach. As the load slowly increases, you're looking at the specific load in each of the elements and seeing whether they're failed or formed hinges. There's guidelines in FEMA 273 and 356, which is the seismic rehabilitations of buildings. Now this gives you guidance on how to approach the design in a performance-based way, and when those hinges will form in your building, and when those hinges will specifically fail. So you can slowly and progressively take them out. Now you could do this by hand, but it'll be painstakingly long, but you wanna make sure that you've automated it. So as you're slowly ramping up the forces, you're instantaneously looking at the different elements in the building, has a hinge formed or has it failed? Now, when a hinge is formed, as we know from the stress strain curve analysis, when we get beyond the elastic range, sometimes it requires very little force to push it beyond those limits. So you need to change the stiffness factors of the hinges when they form. Just because you're going down the performance-based approach and that pushover analysis doesn't mean you neglect the traditional approach as you do need a starting point. So typically when you're starting this type of analysis, you would have already done the traditional method. Also from those traditional methods, it allows you to calculate the forces that the building needs to resist. As when you're doing performance-based approach, you're not neglecting the minimum design requirements, making sure you're still hitting that one in a thousand year earthquake or one in a thousand year wind event. A pushover assessment is quite exciting because as you're ramping up that force, you're looking at where the loads are actually going, looking at which elements are getting overstressed and then changing the stiffness of them when they form into those plastic hinges. And if the load keeps going into those plastic hinges, it can come to a point where you need to remove it from the model. So you're slowly ramping up, removing elements from the model one by one, seeing whether it causes a collapse event or whether the building has drifted too much. So after it's hit the requirements that you've got from FEMA, you can see at what load the building can resist 
and which specific elements need to be strengthened to ensure that the building can meet or exceed those requirements. A performance-based approach allows you to break down different events into different occupancy levels. So with guidance from FEMA, is the building immediately occupiable? Which means that there's very little to no damage to the structure, there may be some minor cracking, and some steel designs may have had some minor yielding, but overall there's been no collapse or no major damage to the building. So this is typically when you're designing the building for serviceability, or if you're designing some of those mission critical or essential buildings such as hospitals, police stations, or fire departments, the next level up for immediate occupancy is life safety performance. So in this area, you have seen some of those plastic deformations. So there's quite significant damage to the building. You'll typically observe some major cracking in the structure, but it wouldn't allow for specific elements to collapse. So before the building can be occupied when it's suffered this level of damage, it will need a condition report done. So they've inspected all the elements and worked out which elements need to be repaired before occupation can occur again. The last and final stage that FEMA gives a classification for is that collapse prevention. So the building has not collapsed at this point, but it's suffered significant damage. So it has major deformations in specific elements. It needs immediate evacuation, so you need to leave the building structure as fast as possible. So it's had significant reduction in strength, so you've had a lot of plastic hinges yielding, but globally overall, the building has not come completely down yet. At this level of damage, it's beyond the repair regions, so it will need to be demolished and rebuilt if it's to be replaced, and ensuring that the building doesn't see an ultimate collapse. So it's achieving that efficiency by strengthening it where it's most needed. If you're interested in supporting the channel, I've got links to my Patreon in the below description, much like these many Patreons over here. Without their support, these type of episodes would not be possible. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.